Welcome, everybody. So real quick, show of hands. We were talking backstage. We want to know how many people here are working for a company. We're just raise your hand if it's under 1,000 people. That's what we thought. OK. <laughs> that helps. So I'm going to have the panel kind of introduce themselves. We really want to dig into, we have a, a short period of time, dig into a bunch of like the recruitment marketing stuff that we want to talk about. Maybe leave a couple of minutes for questions if we can. It's going to be packed. So we'll hope. So I'm going to start with Tarek. Go ahead, introduce yourself, your company, and then maybe something within the TA tech stack that you're excited about. Sure. I'm Tarek Pertu. Uh, I'm the chief creative officer of a company called Uncubed. Uh, and I also founded a soccer league called NYC Footy. Who here plays soccer? I'm always recruiting. <laughs> oh, it's a co-ed league. Nobody? No Liverpool fans out there? <laughs> oh, good, good, good. <laughs> NYCfooty.com. Uh, and I grew up in Tennessee. Any Tennesseans out here? I don't know. I like to see who, who the tribe is, you know. Uh, I'm always excited about um, uh, innovative ways of of um, content in the talent acquisition space. So for instance, I think out of home is gonna play a big role. Soon, you're gonna start seeing subway ads, digital ads outside where it's not all gonna be about product, but it's gonna be about recruiting. I think that's gonna be fun. It's gonna come up, there's gonna be some really fun, I think creative, hopefully colorful and funny ads that we'll start to see soon. What was the name of the company? Uncubed, my company. No, the one that you just said, the, the, you were excited there, about. That to me, it wasn't a company, it was oh, just the just idea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There'll right. probably be loads of companies that do that. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Hopefully. Carson. Hi, everybody. I'm Carson Wagner. I'm the Senior Director of People Ops at Hired, where I've been for the past three years. And um, happy Pride Month to you all. All right. <laughs> Hi, Tiffany Fenster at Stripe. I'm the head of talent there, and I've been there for five years. Uh, the product I'm most excited about in the TA space is the one that still needs to get built to help us with our employee branding and our talent branding. Uh, we all use kind of like cobbled together things on top of Greenhouse, which is great. Uh, but I don't think there's a single product right now that's doing a really helpful job for companies of every stage. And Tiffany's going to Oklahoma tonight, the revival. If you haven't seen it, it's incredible. I went last night. It's insanely awesome. John. Hi, I'm John Cudine. I head up the talent acquisition function at Thomson Reuters, which uh, until recently was a 47,000 person company in 100 countries. We're now at 27,000 after spinning off a division. And we built our talent uh, market marketing function from scratch uh, starting about eight years ago. And we did it stealth. We brought it into the organization. And uh, it's going strong, and it's an important part of the talent acquis acquisition function now. Cool. So I'm going to start with Tarek on the question, and then we can open it up to the rest of the panel for those who want to add in. Employment brand, talent brand, job brand. In recruitment marketing now, we have all of these things that we have to be concerned with. Is there one more important than the other? And if so, why and which one? <clears throat> who here has heard of job brand before? Job brand? Employer, employer brand. OK, talent, talent brand. Yeah, employer brand is the popular one. And I think I've kind of honed a lot of my focus on, on the employer brand and then into sort of an extension of that. So for me, every company has an employer brand. It's there. It's what makes up your company. It's the, the mission. It's the products you're building, the people building it, the environment's being built in, all the benefits, the culture rolls into employer brand. Um, and then activating it is kind of part of the employer branding process, which I think is more of your talent brand, right? It's... It's uh, you know, how to, the perception of it. So you have an employer brand, and then you have employer branding, which leads to the perception of your employer brand. And that's the way my brain works, at least. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, ultimately, it's obviously very important that you build a company that people want to work at. Um, but you, that every company has its different culture. It has its different leadership. And that usually means that the employer brand of an organization is going to be quite different. And I think what, where companies can struggle often is you have companies that have high brand equity like a Spotify. And a lot of candidates feel like they probably know what it's like to work at Spotify because of the power of their product brand. Whereas it might not be at all what that, you know, it's not, maybe people aren't banging drums all day long at Spotify as an example, yeah. which <laughs> people, people might think it's all music all the time. Um, and so that's why it's important, I think, that um, for me, it's the concept of employer branding, which I think might, might connect more with talent brand. I think that's the world I traffic in most, which is, OK, you've got this story, you've got this narrative, you've got this reason people work here. Um, you know, what are you doing to make sure that you activate that publicly so that people can engage with that narrative, see themselves as a fit in it, 
and then ultimately um, find, you know, find a good fit. And then with employer branding, why, why I think it's super important is because it depends on your goals as a business. You have this funnel that operates very similar to marketing funnels, right? The top of the funnel is where people are engaging with the brand. They're, they're expressing some interest. As they move through it, that interest moves towards application and then maybe selection and, and, and your content. The way you brand is actually different through that, throughout that whole funnel. But that all does sort of sit, I think, on the talent brand side of things. Cool. You may want to respond? Yeah. Uh, so people here who are the 500 person to 1,000 person smaller companies, uh, it is very easy. It is such an attractive fiction to be like, employer branding is for when we hire someone to do that in a year, in two years. If you leave here with anything, please leave here knowing that the second you have an employee or a candidate, leave your company, leave your building, and talk about their experience, talk about what it's like to work there. You have an employer brand, whether you meant to or not. Uh, so the best thing you can do for yourself is to make sure that it's intentional, that it's something that you are going out into the market with intentionally, and that it's cohesive and reflective of what it's actually like there, uh, because otherwise the market will determine it for you, and then you've already got things to make up, and you can't kind of come back from that. I, I would say one of the key things I found is honesty and authenticity is critical with your brand. As we've mentioned, you already have one in the marketplace. People know what it is, and they need to understand why it's for them, if it is for them, but they need to understand why it's for them. And so if your company is um, chaotic and it's difficult to get things done and you need people who are laser focused to work in that environment, that's a positive for the right person out there in the marketplace. Lean into it and talk about those things so that the right person gets excited about working for your company. I agree. I think that when you think about uh, employer branding, you want to make sure that people know why it's for them. But as equally, you want to make sure people know why it's not for them. Yeah. I think the best branding attracts and repels. Um, it's so much better to know early on where the fit is. Um, I kind of think it's like dating. You're not for everybody, right? And everybody is not for you. You just have to be your best self, and then you find the people that are the right for you. It's crazy how we've gotten to that point, um, and I think we've seen it over the last 24 months where it used to be uh, employment branding, talent branding, all of this stuff was about how do we get everybody in the world and are in our market interested in coming to work for us? And now I think we're starting to see this transition where we're going, okay, here's who we are. We love who we are. You might hate who we are. That's good. We, want you to, we, we don't want you anyways, right? <laughs> um, and I, we were talking um, kind of backstage. My, my best example of this is like Amazon, right? Amazon's this gigantic machine that's just pushing forward. They're known for hiring like type A, just crazy maniacal work ethics types of people. Zappos might be on the other side of that, where they're hiring like a, a, just a completely different worker. Both of them have done a great job of saying, here's who we are and here's who we want. And it's OK that if you don't want that, because we don't want you either. And it's a really hard thing, as we talked, of getting our executives to understand that, that it's no longer about everybody. It's really about less. Now, who here, by a show of hands, actually needs talent right now? <laughs> that, that's the problem, right, is that if you go and you sell somebody, well, we want to try to like, reduce the market of what we want. How is that going to give us more people? But it actually works that way. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk about job brand. And I brought job brand up because I think when we take a look at the environment and marketplace of who comes and sees us, many times that candidate, the first touch they have is on a job. It's on LinkedIn. It's on Indeed. It's on Zip. It's on, they're, they're seeing that job. And then they don't even know who we are. We all kind of like have an inflated self inside of what our brand is because we work there and we love it. But most people in the marketplace have no idea. So when you think about what we can do from a job brand standpoint, you guys have any opinions on how we make that pop, potentially because that's the first touch somebody has with us? Yeah, and thank you for defining that because it is relatively new to me, but it, there is a brand with a job, and you're right, that is an early touch point and often the only touch point someone might have with the, with the company before they bounce. And the right? hard part is most of our jobs are like cut and paste a job description, which yeah. is so... Yeah. Crappy. Exactly, yeah. Say other words, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, and we've been thinking a lot about that. Um, I don't know how many people here are familiar with UnQ, but we have an agency attached to it, so we create a lot of visual content for employer branding purposes. And one of the things that we've been trying to deploy into the market aggressively with, with um, I'd say, slower than we'd like uptake, and we discussed that backstage as to why we think that is, are video job postings. And, it's, and you, using B-roll from an organization or using animations that help bring to light what life is like at a company and then layering the text of a job posting on top of it. And then all of a sudden, you can now deploy a very visual 
uh, job description via social outlets, of course. You can deploy it out of home on digital billboards, whatever it might be. But this gives somebody actually the opportunity to contextualize what life might be like at the company by reading a, a job description. Because all job descriptions look the exact same. And you're trying to cut through words and phrases to understand what a company is about. And I think there's loads of statistics as how powerful video is in terms of somebody being able to get a richer contextual understanding of something. And job descriptions will ultimately go that way. It just it requires experimentation and progressive leadership, I think, that are saying, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna try this. But that's, that's what I think, at least as an example uh, for the job brand. There was a Skill Scout, which is a company out of Chicago. They do um, video job postings and they've done the measurement. You've, you get about, on a, on a written job posting that's all just text, you get about 12 seconds that a candidate will look at that. If you have video, it goes up to 47 seconds. And that's a huge amount of difference in terms of that interaction with your brand. And a lot of those videos, potentially they could be overly produced, kind of like you know commercials. Yeah. Or it could be just a hiring manager going, here's who I am and here's what it's like to work for me. Or one of the actual people doing the job in a very kind of just, hey, here's my iPhone, I'm gonna get you, you know, and put that out there. And to me, it's such a giant interaction of, of what we're doing from that. Yeah, it's gonna, everyone's gonna do it soon enough, I think. Yeah, I agree. But in the meantime, we still have lots of people who are thinking about what they can do with their job descriptions today. Yeah. Um, I can tell you what we have done at Hired, um, two things, in fact. One, I often ask my recruiters to apply, to pretend to apply to Hired and see what it looks like. Like look for an account executive job in New York, right? And see how our job description compares to everybody else's. What stands out at other companies and what can we, what can we take? What, what, what should we leave? Um, and then I want to share with all of you something that we've done that's really helped get more people in our pipeline, specifically around uh, diversity and inclusion. We actually changed uh, just some of the language in our job descriptions about what we stand for and who we look for. Um, instead of putting in what, what your general counsel says, like, hey, we are an EEOC company, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, we rewrote that, and we talk about bringing your whole self to work, and these are things that really we value at Hired. And after trying it out, just changing language in our job description, we saw a huge increase in diverse candidate pools applying to us. So I think people are out there. I mean, as you've said, like, they're, they're just trying to give their attention to the right places. And uh, just a small tweak. I, I encourage all of you to go back home and take a look at your job descriptions and see what you can tweak. It's, it really is your first impression. Carson, have you guys been using any tech specifically to help you with that? Uh, we've been doing it ourselves. OK, so I know obviously the big one out there is Texio. Mm -hmm. They'll say about 70% of all job descriptions are written in a male voice. Mm -hmm. And when you change that, it's insane. You can actually see the numbers of female applies that take place. Here's, so you guys, this is kind of a funny kind of thing, but um, most job descriptions are written in the male voice, and so males will actually apply to anything. They don't care. Um, females are really specific. So if they read something and they don't feel like they're a fit, they won't apply. And, and thus, when it's written in a male voice, they don't apply. So if you want more applies, especially from a female audience, write it in a female voice you know, from a gender perspective. And to be very clear on what is a required and what is a nice to have, uh, to the same point there, women will only apply if they hit all of them, and men are like, eh, 70% sounds good, yeah. and then apply that way. Yeah. Um, and to the jobs page point, so our company, Stripe, redesigned our jobs page last year, spent a ton of time on it. Uh, the one thing I will say is like my main takeaway here is that if you are not being authentic and letting your company do the work for you by being very coherent about who you are and really having a good deal of self-knowledge, it's not going to work very well. So you can make an all singing, all dancing jobs page, but if you are a very serious, kind of hardworking company, candidates are going to see that and kind of notice the disconnect there. So we kind of went very front facing with the first thing you see on our jobs page is a video of our co-founder uh, and our COO kind of talking to one another uh, about the company. And they're being like slightly goofy, but being mostly about the work and about how hard it is and where we're working and that we're a global company. So it is the things that really resonate for people who work there that people can see when they're coming to apply. So making sure that you're just very clear and coherent with your vision of what is your company about. So Tiffany, I want to, I want to stay with you on the next question. So when we think about scaling recruitment marketing, right now we have recruiter candidate, one to one. We all kind of get that. How do you go from like one to many? How do you go from recruiter or a company organization to many candidates? Yeah. Uh, as cheaply as possible, I will say for everyone in this room. Uh, it is very hard to kind of get the resources to have a really robust 
you know, recruiting marketing arm if you are a small company, if you're a company that's not at that stage yet. Uh, so we wanted to, at Stripe at least, go from the, you know, reach out on LinkedIn, recruiter tell the story, uh, to really leveraging what the company was about for the ecosystem and for potential candidates and to reach many, many people. Uh, so I'll tell the brief story. So our fifth engineering hub at Stripe is remote. So US remotes, that is our engineering hub. And with this announcement, uh, we reached out to the community and to say, okay, if you are a person who is a remote engineer, you don't have to come work at Stripe, totally get it. But if you want to talk about what that experience is like and hear from other folks, we're going to hold a remote coffee chat with our CEO and a couple of our engineering managers and invite whoever wants to come for 45 minutes to talk. And we had 1,700 people sign up and 900 people show up and then 700 of those converted to candidates. Uh, this was the first try of this. We are certainly going to repeat it. But I think doubling down on what your company is good at and what your company is about without spending any additional money or any additional resources can really, really help to reach a wider audience of exactly the folks that you want to apply. John? Yeah, I, I would echo exactly the same thing. We did a similar uh, process down in our Dallas marketplace and we leveraged our business people to get out there and build relationships put on a virtual chat in the same way and it was just a huge branding impact that we had in the marketplace and our you always think about oh it's the recruiters job to go out and recruit and find candidates and sell the company and brand and everything else and yes it is but it's also the responsibility of everyone else in the company to build those relationships and talk about what they do and why they love what they do at this particular organization, whichever one it happens to be. Um, and to me, that's how you get the enormous uh, exponential impact of branding in the market is through those other voices. How many people here feel like if you were to pull 10 people from your organization and they had to give the employer value proposition to a candidate that you might get 10 different answers? <laughs> most I'll raise them. my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Especially from office to office. I think most of you would raise your hand if maybe I had asked that in a more simple way. <laughs> Basically, we, this is something we hear all the time is that um, companies are looking for a consistent message on what we offer as a company and who we really are so that if candidates are hearing it in different locations around the country or the globe or they're hearing it from different um, organization, different areas within the company, whether it's engineering or sales or marketing, that they're getting this, a consistent message about what does this company have to offer me. And I think that's something that when you're thinking about scaling, that only gets harder if you don't, there's a premium on doing these things early, right? So if you are a smaller organization and you start thinking about these things now, there's a little effort now that then exponentiates quite nicely with scale where you know, there's, a, there's a message that everybody shares. You don't have challenges with the consistency there. And, um, and that's just something to think about. And that's, again, you know, for us, the reason we continue to love video is you can get that message on video and then everyone can have that asset. And it's like, this is the asset that, that you can educate people internally on or that you can share publicly with everybody so that they can understand what the, you know, what the employee value proposition is. Another thing that I think is interesting with scale is um, who here wishes they had a robust tech blog as an example? And then who here doesn't have a, a great robust tech blog? <laughs> it's about the same. Um, it's hard to get engineers to contribute to it, but we know, especially when we're hiring engineers, that they want to know what you're building. They want to know it's interesting. And if they land on your career page and you've got, you know, articles that are talking about your contributions to the open source or, uh, or some, I don't know, maybe you've, you've even invented some new languages that people are using, that's super powerful for recruiting, but good luck getting an engineer to contribute that content. They've got other things to do. But early in an organization, that can be a job requirement. Saying, like, look, every month you have to contribute a piece of content. That's just part of it. Or if it's too late, then change the bonus structure and start thinking about, hey, you're gonna, we're gonna now add a bonus structure for engineers that contribute content or other team members so that you can start to develop this Rolodex or this library of content that can then be leveraged as a part of your overall recruitment marketing strategy over time. I, I you wanna know, go back help to, scale. Yeah, go ahead. to two things really quickly. The first is we talked about a consistent message. Consistent message doesn't mean saying the same thing to everybody, right? right. It means having a consistent idea of who you are, your identity, but how you express that message is gonna vary based on who you're speaking with. You're gonna to talk to a salesperson very differently than you're going to talk to a technologist. It's just the reality. And if you're not doing that, you're really not gonna be successful in getting the different aspects of your brand across. And that goes not just for functional areas, but it might be locations. The way we talk about our brand in the UK is really different from how we talk about it in India. And something struck me about the job conversation. We, we have a couple of hundred people who do recruitment or touch recruiting in our company. 
um, and therefore it's really hard to get them to write consistent job descriptions. Um, we tell them to write the way they talk in a meeting. So how you meet, whether that's serious and solemn and facts driven or whether that's a lot of fun and kind of goofy, um, that's what we want to come across in the uh, job description because it's an authentic representation of right. what it's like to work there. Yeah. It's, that's a work in progress, by the way. A great exercise to do in your companies is to, I mean, talk about EVP, is try to do an EVP in seven words and, and throw it out to your entire company and see what comes back. Because that's the marketing message, right? Like it's, again, it's not gonna be the same, but like that idea, it's really hard. It to have hard. to say who we are in one sentence. And, and then I always put seven words because it's, it's really hard. <laughs> Um, but it just shows, again, how hard it is to get that message out of who we are from that perspective. Yeah. Um, John, I want to stay with you in terms of measurement. When we talk about recruitment marketing, how do you know if it's actually working or not? Uh, it depends what you're trying to impact, right? So you, in, where I work, if you're not measuring something, it's not really happening. And so you have to have a story to tell through the metrics. And we've identified two things that were most important to us. One was, um, do people understand our brand in the marketplace? Right, really simple. Um, and the second is, are we driving candidates to apply for our roles? Okay, and we can talk about quality candidates and things like that, but these were just at a really high level when we thought about it. So it became a very simple question and problem to solve. And so we looked at um, our three key brand pillars within the organization. Um, when they applied for a position, how much did they know about that? After they interviewed for a role, how much did they know? And did we move the needle on that at all, mm -hmm. right? And did we see people um, responding positively to those messages? Um, and we did that, by the way, we segmented that by function. So we knew whether we were hitting, tell a little story, um, within our company, obviously I'm part of the HR organization, and I came up to the head of HR and I said, look, some people in this company are more important than other people when it comes to recruiting. And that's our salespeople, it's our technologists, it's our industry experts. And I honestly don't care when we're recruiting our HR people or our finance folks or things like that, um, whether we're being super effective at branding our company because we'll get good people to join us in those functional areas. But that's, that's our key differentiator are those three marketplaces. And so um, after some discussion and some HR dancing around of language, we agreed that we would really target those three folks. And that's what we measure. We measure what's our brand impact with our technologists, our industry experts, and our salespeople, and what kind of growth in applications and quality of applications have we seen for those people. And how are you measuring these things? Uh, that's a good question. We, we wanted to do it as simply as possible, because if it's hard, you don't do it. Um, and we, we use survey vehicles. I mean, we do, we do focus groups and things like that, but those are like a, an every two or three year activity. We rely on surveys. Everyone who applies to us, they get an invitation to complete a survey. Everyone who interviews with us, whether or not they get the job, they get a survey. We get about a 37% response rate on our surveys, which we're super psyched about. Pretty high. Um, and so, and then we segment those, we know. Where are they applying for a position? We know what level, we know what functional area, we know all of these things, and we can break down where we're getting the message across and where we're not. Um, and, and we find out where we're making mistakes. I mean, we, we had a, a really bad experience about five years ago where a key uh, component of our brand was dropping like a rock in the marketplace. And we sat back and we said, well, why is that? What can we do to fix that? Let's try a couple of things and let's see it how, how it moves the needle. And if we weren't doing quick hit measurements on a monthly basis, um, it would have been a year and a half before we discovered that. Any other measures? Yeah, I was gonna say we do something uh, fairly similar to smaller scale at Hired. <clears throat> so as somebody who leads talent acquisition and HR, I do some dancing around. <laughs> and um, the dancing that I do is after we hire people and I ask them, does the job you have match the job you thought you'd have based on the interview process? Is the company that you work at the company that you thought you were going to be working at based on all of the touch points that you had along the way? And it's just a yes or a no. And we keep track of that. And we keep track of it by function, by hiring manager, by team. Um, so that, that's how we measure that. It gives us a really good sense of where our message is working and when it's not. At what point do you do that? Uh, we do it one month in. One month in. Yeah. 
We do to do a brief plug for Greenhouse also. Some of the ROI that we measure on employer branding, a lot of it comes from events. So we will hold different kinds of events with different segments of the market, all things like that. Greenhouse tagging, very like low tech way to do this, but very effective to see when you met that person first. Right. And a lot of times events are the long tail way to get people into process. So we hire folks two years after we first met them at an event, but they become brand evangelists over time and they come to more events and they bring people with them. So that's like a very easy kind of hacky way to do it if you have to. We also use Culture Amp to survey folks uh, whether they had a good experience or not, when they know they've made an offer or not to them, right. and then again when they come on board after 90 days. Because you had you'd mentioned that simply changing a job description or making sure that women are writing them, that's, that's a way of measuring right there. I mean, how many, how many women have applied for this role? How many women are now applying for the role after we've changed mm -hmm. the job description? Mm -hmm. That's right. These are things that we can all do. You don't need crazy technology to know if it works, to be able to go back and say, just FYI, you know, we invested in this tool and we've seen, you know, a 30% increase in female engineering applicants as a result. Um, yeah, and you can see that along pretty much, I'd, I'd say like we were talking about the tech blog, if you, ha if you, if you profile, a, let's say a, an engineer, a female uh, engineer or, or, or a person of color that's an engineer or both, if you profile them and you can get that in front of your target demographic, you should see a disproportionate number of applicants come because they are, the, the, you, you've touched that in inclusion component. I can relate to this individual. I can see myself there. And that's power of, of content as well. And, you, and that's an easy way to, to measure it if you, I mean, it, you have to measure it beforehand also, which is how many you know, female people of color engineers have been applying to this job. Now that we've started this campaign, how many are we seeing there, as, are we seeing an increase? So simple things like surveys and just measuring some of the data you already have should be enough for you to go back and say, look, we've measured this, and we're seeing, we're seeing the results we're looking for. Uh, Tarek, we went with a, a product. We put it in place. We did a pilot, and we said, how are we going to measure whether this is successful or not? And uh, we looked at, we made sure we had a data set prior to move, putting the product in place. We looked at it, and this was around diversity. And we said, okay, this is what we have today. This is what we have after using the product effectively. We made sure we're using it correctly. Um, and there was no movement. I mean, it was like half, per, half a percent difference, which was statistically insignificant. Um, and so we decided that it was not worth investing in that product to move yeah. forward and, and, and do that work. So look, we're all operating on shoestring budgets. We're all trying to figure out how we move a little money from here over to here to use in uh, recruitment marketing. And so it becomes vital to do those measurements to see what's actually working and where your investments are paying off. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, um, I did, uh, I, I, I worked in a recruiting shop, so I, I measure everything. And we I actually put in digital call software, so I could measure every single incoming outgoing call, which is a little psychotic, right? I want to work for you, too. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, but here's the, here's, the, here's the best part of it. I never told my team I put it in and measured for a month. Because I need a baseline. We get back to, I need a baseline of what reality is. And then I said, oh, by the way, on Monday, we're going to have this new software that measures every call you make. And calls went up that Monday 40%. Because, but they, <laughs> they already knew. They didn't know it was already measuring. But then little by little, it went back to baseline. So then we could start doing incentives or doing programs or whatever to kind of figure out, hey, what's the capacity level we could get to if we needed to? Now, again, I don't use it as a hammer. It was used for development. If I know somebody's, like I have a recruiter that's brand new and they're making 200 calls a week, but they're only getting a handful of candidates to send on to a hiring manager, I know that their, that messaging of them has to improve and stuff like that. So there's a difference between are we using it for development, using it for a hammer from that standpoint. But like it gets back to knowing your baseline and then putting something in and going and testing from that standpoint. Yeah. Karsten, um, for you, let's, everybody here basically said, hey, we need talent. <laughs> so when you think about recruitment marketing at Hired, what are you guys doing right now that's having an impact that's really working? Um, something that we did fairly recently that, that has worked for us because it speaks to our values, um, we published our demographics, our, our diversity demographics, we published our wage gap demographics. Like, it was difficult to do, it was uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and we had some uncomfortable conversations agreeing to actually do it and what to publish. But uh, we stand for transparency. This is one of our values at the company. You should experience that through the uh, interview process as well. Mm -hmm. So that really worked. Here's why. Not just because we were putting our money where our mouth was in terms of, hey, this is who we are. This is what you'd be joining. Um, but it also became a really good conversation piece throughout the interview process 
for what we stand for in terms of promotions, how we think about compensation, um, all of these kinds of things. So when people join <coughs> hired, they don't tend to have lots of questions about um, why their salary is what it is. They already know. Mm -hmm. When are they going to be promoted? What do they need to do in order to do that? They already know. We've already talked about it. So that's something that um, wasn't terribly expensive for us to do. It took some work um, doing the analysis and looking at our reporting, but putting it out there for everyone to look at. You can look at it today, hired.com slash diversity. Um, it's helped us a lot. Cool. Tiffany. So I think figuring out what your company is really good at and doubling down on that, again, I will just keep saying this. So looking and asking kind of the five whys or the five hows, like, okay, this is what you say you do. How do you do that? And keep asking that question until it starts to match something you can do on the employment brand side. So for us, uh, Stripe is insanely good at documentation and really, really into education. So okay, those should probably be part of our employment brand. Um, the thing I won't tell you to do is start a magazine or a book press, but that is what Stripe did for reasons other than employment branding. Uh, but now that goes out into the market and technical people can see Increment, our magazine that publishes quarterly, that has like useful advice about security, about the cloud, about on-call rotations, uh, and it's kind of doing the work for us. Mm -hmm. So if you can leverage parts of your business that are not specifically recruiting or marketing to give you collateral that is incredibly helpful in finding the exact people you want to go after, that is a huge part of the battle. Um, the other part being just consistent in all of your recruiting practices. Once you get people on site, like this is the very low hanging fruit stuff. If your house is not in order in terms of doing the things you say you're going to do and being the place you say you are, like candidates will immediately be like lack of authenticity kills you every time, no matter how slick your collateral is, no matter how good any of the other stuff is, you're just not going to be able to tread on that for very long. I think, Carson, did you say that you have your recruiters apply to your jobs? Yeah, well, I have and, them apply and, and look and see what yeah, the other, market's like right now. So I know um, I will tell people um, as well, like um, TA leaders, to have their teams apply to the jobs, but not like at their desktop. I'm like, go down to like the local McDonald's and steal the Wi-Fi on your mobile device and, and actually apply to your job, and you get a reality of what com like the actual candidate's feeling, and then they come back and go, oh yeah, crap, that's bad, because like after three clicks, you lose about 60% of those candidates, especially if you're hiring hourly and you need more. If you need more hourly candidates you better have just a, a super simple one-click, two-click apply process on a mobile device. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, you have just, you're losing so many candidates, it's crazy. John, what are you guys doing that's working? Yeah, so um, our biggest discovery was to give our employees um, a voice and to give them a platform and to give them an uncensored voice. And that uncensored part is what's really hard, especially at a large company because they're like, you're gonna let people do this? What if they say this or that other thing? And you know, we've had one problem in eight years in what an employee has said publicly through one of our channels. Um, and we've had so many other great experiences um, where people have told us, you know, I saw this person in the Philippines who was talking about what they do outside of work and how they bring that passion into work and it made me really want to apply for a job at the company. And your employees are your best ambassadors. Um, they're the ones who are gonna excite people about coming to work there, but you have to give them a voice. Otherwise, nobody's gonna hear about it. How, how do you get the details a little bit? How, where's the platform, how did you do that? Yeah, so we, we did, so easy, I would say um, inexpensive to expensive. Yeah. <laughs> um, inexpensive was, you know what? Let's um, give them a hashtag on social platforms and let them tweet about whatever in the world's going on in their life. Right? We prefer it to be related to work, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and we get, I don't know, it's probably about 30 um, pieces of content on a daily basis related to that. And the engagement levels on it are enormous. That's the real key piece. Um, and then we said, okay, well, that's good, but let's do something else. And then we put together these seminars, right, where we said, let's get our people out there talking and make it available to anybody. Come in, you don't have to pay anything, just learn a little bit more about not our company, but about this industry or about this new technology or whatever it might be. And that took off because the passion was obvious when our employees got up there and talked about it. Everybody wants to work with passionate people. Um, it's the num number one reason I go to work every day. Yep. Um, when I was at Applebee's, we did um, a, ha a hashtag like similar to that. We had managers, and we had to kind of force it. We were like, hey, once a day, 
-hmm. you got to find an employee doing something great. You're going to take a picture. You're going to hashtag it. You're going to put it on IG. And that we saw too was the engagement level with all of it was so much higher than every other piece of content we have. Yeah. Because people are just like, I want to go work for someone that cares about me like that. And then what we found was there are certain managers that was just natural. They were doing it multiple times during the day. They were they were even bringing like um, guests in on that you know kinds of content. And it's building their brand yes. for their career as well. You know, we started with eight graduates um, and said, you know what, we're going to try it with these eight people and see what happens. And it just grew organically. I mean, we really didn't have to do a lot of promotion. People found out about it and it's like, oh, I'm going to take advantage of this. And two years later, our CEO was using the hashtag. So without being told to. <laughs> Tarek, anything that you, uh, go ahead and respond. I want, I, want to, yeah, I want to respond because you had mentioned, you know, identify what you're good at. Yeah. And then you, you were talking about Applebee's and it reminded me that if you actually go to McDonald's has a really interesting employer branding campaign about America's best first job. Because that's what they're good at, right? Yeah. They're like, we're good at being your first job. We're gonna really focus on a certain audience and then they explain the value proposition through, through video. And I, it's great. I mean, it's like I'm sure that's working great for them because they recognize what they're good at. They're putting it out in the marketplace and they're telling a little bit of the narrative that you said you saw at Applebee's. I think that was smart. Sorry, what was your question? Well, from a recruitment marketing Look that side, up, yeah. <laughs> but from an RM side, when you think about what, what's working for you, what's filling that top of funnel, what, what, are you, what are you guys doing or what are you seeing? I mean, for us, it's, it's um, again, I, tools are not, I, don't, I won't focus on tools as much as the behavior. Yeah. And for us, I think show versus tell is probably the most critical thing that you can focus on that leads to authenticity. People are beyond the, the days. If you remember Anchorman where he's like telling everybody I'm kind of a big deal, like I'm kind of a big deal. A lot of companies, that's their approach to employer branding, right? It's like, we're, we're great. We're kind of a big deal. They'll put someone on camera and say, why do you like working here? And the person's like, the people are so smart. Uh, we're changing the world. Uh, great mobility. The, ping pong table is new, whatever it is, they're telling you stuff, but they're not showing you anything. And I think that's where you will lose today's generation for sure, because their response is, I don't believe you. It's just why, of course you're gonna tell me that. But if there's so many powerful opportunities to show what you're doing, right? It's like, what's a recent, you know, what, what's a recent challenge you just had, right? We, 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 there's this great video with Uber. It's like, well, you know, we get destroyed on New Year's Eve. Okay, so how do you solve for that? So it's a two minute video of an engineer explaining that they use Halloween as like this testing ground for exploring ways to make sure that cars show up on time on New Year's Eve so that nobody waits. And that's like, great, this person's explaining a challenge they have. You're, if you're filming it, you get the office environment, you get what people are working on, you see the types of challenges that they're working on, all of this comes through in a show format. Whereas if that engineer stepped back and said, we solve really interesting problems, the people here are great, we're diverse, it doesn't work. Yep. So. I'd say if you could tattoo something to yourself in terms of like core principles when it comes to recruitment marketing, employer branding, authenticity, show versus tell, keep it short, keep the content short, you know, people don't stick around for long. Hone in on those three things and it'll, it'll work. Yeah, that's really true. That's something that we're actually talking about doing at Hired Now is showing more, right? Um, something that we consistently hear from, from our employees and from candidates is, people are, are considering coming to join hire, they want to leave where they are because they're not able to grow, right? So something that we want to show people is our own internal growth numbers so people can see that mobility is real at hire, that you can grow, that we've done you know, hundreds of promotions in the last you know, three or four quarters. And um, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Just ha, show the work as opposed to getting on video and saying like, hey, we yeah. work hard and play hard. It's the same effort to interview someone and say tell, and it's also harder if someone were to ask me, I've found it on Cube. Why do you love on Cube? I'd like freeze up. <laughs> like this is weird and awkward and now I've got to pretend all these things. It's like Bonnie just say, Tark, what do you do every day? Show the world kind of what you're doing. Then it's, that's easier for me and it's also better for the viewer, for their experience. This is why the like, how is the unblocking question. Where you're like, we're changing the world. Keep asking how oh, yeah. until you get to the incredibly so specific should, exactly. two second thing that people will be like, yes, that thing. That's right. And it's so good for the company because if you answer that how, well then now the differentiation of what makes you different than someone else starts to show up. Because so long as people are just telling, then you just sound like every other company. Yeah. All right, 30 seconds each. We're gonna end with one idea, one tactic, one something you want everybody to take away from this. John, we'll start with you. Uh, put me on the spot, thank you, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I, I would say it's easy. Start today, start small, pick something inexpensive. If you get all wrapped up into 
well, we need this big campaign and this big initiative and we need all these approvals and we need a budget and everything else, you will never do it. Um, start small and start tomorrow or today. I think mine is regardless of size, find a way to create value that has nothing to do with whether a person's gonna come work for you. Uh, if that's hosting an event that's like good for people to meet each other, uh, if it's posting a blog post about how you solved a really hard problem, these are the things that are authentic and these are the things that people will respond to way better than if you spend $10,000 on some kind of campaign. Yeah, I would say go back to your offices and rewrite your job descriptions. <laughs> um, rewrite every single one, make it sound like you. Make it sound different from everybody else. Yeah, I mean, again, we, we struggle because there's a legal aspect that HR will push back and say, no, 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 we have to have this. And a posting and a job description are two different two things. Two different things. Have a posting that's great, that's you, and then have a job description that you can give to somebody when they come to the interview or whatever like that. Like, I agree with you on that. Sure. I'll, I'm just going to re reiterate what John said. I think if you snooze, you lose. That's, you got to get started. There's a reason people work at your company right now. There's a reason they accepted a job. You're just not, get that narrative out there. Don't wait for your values to be posted on the front wall. Don't wait, don't wait for your, your founder to redo their values. Don't wait for it to move into your new office. I know there's loads of people here thinking that same thing now. Like, we'll get started once these things happen. If you snooze, you lose. Just get started. There's, there's so much content out there that you can be creating and that you should be creating and, and just get started. Do an event, do whatever it is, write a blog post. And again, think about some mechanisms you can create that'll actually motivate and encourage people to do it. And, um, and just here's the other thing is, and we mentioned this backstage, it is a long-term strategy. So there is a chance that whatever you put in place now at your company, you will be gone before the results really start to materialize for that effort. And that might be a reason people aren't super motivated to do it. But as a professional that's growing, do that, get started, do something for this organization, get it started, know that it's gonna take, in many cases, years to really develop into something that works all day, every day for a company. Cool, I'll wrap it up. Make sure you reach out to these people. I agree with, with everything you just said. I will say, if you go to your CFO and you say, I have a big program we wanna do around recruitment marketing, then they're gonna ask for a lot. If you go to them and say, I have a small test I wanna do, yeah. they will go, okay, let's do it. So don't, don't bolt on giant programs. Start testing and failing and then readjusting and testing some more, and you'll find really great stuff to do. Thank you guys so much. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>